You are never alone. <laughs> my mom, my mom used to sing this song to us. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. You know this one? 20 years ago, I was 19, just 19, living in Haiti. It was the worst period of my life. And it was all because my eyes were on, on me. Just come off my second round of malaria, lost a lot of weight and a lot of sleep. I was teaching second grade. I love the kids, but I'm deathly shy. And I just felt like a fish out of water getting up in front of them and talking. My dad had had this massive heart attack back in the States and I couldn't get home. We couldn't communicate because of the tensions politically in the nations. So emotionally, physically, spiritually, it just felt like the, the bottom of the barrel fell out. And I know this, and I say it in kindness, there's a selfishness to suffering that we need to be attentive to. And it was in that season that a friend invited me and Scott and Ashmel, two friends of mine, to go preach in this country church up in the mountains. And so we make our way there. And as we arrive after a day hike, the sun is setting and people are just walking from all over the place. You don't know where they're coming from. And there are four corners on the church building and just a tin roof, it's open and there are people seated everywhere and standing everywhere. Some are on these hard rocks and hard log benches, but they're singing. You know the kind of singing I'm talking about where you just don't want it to stop and they sing and they sing for hours and there's testimonies and there's prayer and the word of God's read aloud in like hour four? They say it's time to preach. And so we preach and we're done and they sing some more and then they look at us and go, encore, our sermons are never that good, right? <laughs> and so we preach again and then they lead us to this hut where we're gonna spend the night little mud-baked thatch roof hut. And we're laying out our bedding and I'm spraying down with mosquito repellent and in walks the owner of the hut, little Haitian man with an oil lamp. And he laughs loudly. This happens when I take my shirt off in public places, okay? And so <laughs> he says, we, we don't have mosquitoes at this time of the year, you won't need that. And so I turn to my friends, I'm like, wow, first good night's rest in a long time. And then as he's walking out of the hut, he turns back and he says, we don't have mosquitoes, we have rats. <laughs> and so I'm like, what, what? I thought laughing like you, but then I wanted to cry. And so I click off my flashlight and within seconds we're all in there and it sounds like someone has a bag of Ruffles potato chips and they're just smashing them above us. We click our lights back on and there are eyes everywhere, rats, and they're just coming down out of the thatch, and they saw us like a superhighway between where they were living and their feeding ground, and so I'm praying in precatory prayers, right? <laughs> God, strike down my enemies, yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death. <laughs> and I never really wake up the next morning because I never really went to sleep the night before, and so we, we teach on the life of Jesus the whole day where our feet were just exhausted and they decide to finally feed us and the whole village gathers around this little table and they want to watch us eat what's a delicacy. Just parts of a goat that God never wanted us to eat, right? And so when it's done, they bring us this water and it's a different shade of clear than I'm familiar with and we <laughs> wash it down and then it's, it's time to preach again. So we preach again and you think it's discouraging when people sleep through one of your sermons. It's really discouraging when you sleep through the sermon you're preaching, right? And so we go back and I tell my buddies, I can't, I can't stay in this hut. So I go outside with my clothes and I just lay down in the grass and God has the funniest sense of humor. It just starts to rain, like <laughs> Noah, epic rain. And so I'm looking for the rainbow, there's no rainbow. And so I go inside the hut and we spend another sleepless night awake with the rats. And Sunday morning rolls around and Scott, Scott preaches on the crucifixion and I preach on the resurrection. And we should never be surprised that when we speak on the crucified Savior and the risen Lord, people respond. And they come forward and they want to be baptized. And I'm looking around like, where's the water? That's my first thought, where's the water? 
But the people in the church could care less about that, so they just start standing up and singing and like this dancing, and we're just walking up one hill and down another for several hours, and they never stop singing, I'm a sweaty mess. We get to this water hole, and it's green, and it's thick, and there are animals in it, and everybody just lines up. And that's when it hit me. I could hear my mom. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. I had lost sight of Jesus in the midst of ministry. But I found him again on the faces of people who didn't seem to care about walking miles to be baptized in a river with parasites or sitting or standing in a church building for hours on end or sleeping in huts with rodents. And I sensed the Holy Spirit saying to me, John, the blood that dripped from the four corners of the cross must find its way to the four corners of the earth because suffering doesn't discriminate. Suffering permeates every nation, tribe, people, and language. No one is safe from suffering, no one. And therein lies the eternal hope and scope of Revelation 7. Friends, someday, God is going to wring the earth dry of every drop of sweat and every drop of blood and every teardrop. And John aims the telescope at heaven, and with Hubble-like precision, he leaves this image behind for us. Then one of the elders asks me, these in the white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again, never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will lead them to springs of li living water. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Wow. Someday, God will wipe every tear from every eye. But someday isn't today, right? Today and someday, at least not yet. So what do we do until then? Can I remind all of us? Because we're family. The revelation is a vision. The great apocalypse, the peak behind the curtain. So what we see today has everything to do with where we focus our eyes and who we focus our eyes on. Dr. Robert Coleman, the author of The Master Plan of Evangelism, best friend of Billy Graham, is now a member of our church back in Lexington, and I asked him recently in a private conversation, Dr. Coleman, what are you working on? 86 years of age one of the most beautiful human beings I know. And you know what he said to me? He said, John, I'm memorizing Revelation. And I said, you're doing what? He said, I'm memorizing Revelation. And this beautiful baritone voice of his, he said, I want to know what to sing. And more importantly, who to sing it to. And I know the expression of my face just sh showed it. He took hold of my hands and he looked at me and he said, John, when we get there, we don't want to be caught looking down at sheet music. <laughs> when we can look him in the eyes and sing right to him. 